Paleoanthropologists know that archaic hominins, known as Homo erectus, ventured over land bridges into parts of what is now Indonesia over a million years ago. But farther east, past the so-called Wallace Line or Weber Line, it was thought that these hominins ran into ocean currents considered impassable without boats. In fact, Russell Chioshon, a paleoanthropologist at the University of Iowa, told National Geographic that water dispersal by Homo erectus is accidental. There's no manifest destiny, there's no plot, he concluded. Nonetheless, while it's pure speculation, other paleoanthropologists argue you could posit that Homo erectus used simple watercraft to cross straits and arrive at far-flung islands such as Papua New Guinea and make some convincing arguments. This theory aligns with the idea that, while Homo erectus may not have been master seafarers, their cognitive and technological capabilities allowed them to exploit natural resources, including driftwood, for simple canoes, which contributed to their successful dispersal across island chains. The question of whether Homo erectus, our early human ancestor, had the capability to construct boats, is tied closely to their cognitive abilities, specifically their capacity for complex communication and language. In this video, we will examine insights into the relationship between language and tool-making, focusing on Homo erectus's ability to construct boats. Long before Europeans landed in Papua, ancient humans discovered this land, which during most of the last two million years was connected to Australia to form the continent of Sahul. In fact, Papuans were some of the most advanced canoeists in the world, with huge dugout canoes that could carry dozens of warriors. They were also advanced sailors, regularly making trips to Australia and Indonesia when Europeans first arrived. But how ancient is this expertise watercraft? And could it predate Homo sapiens? We know from many other sites that early humans were building some kind of shelter at least 800,000 years ago. The construction of boats and shelters requires significant technical skills, but they differ in complexity and the level of planning involved. Both involve working with wood and other natural materials and need to ensure durability and, in the case of boats, for waterproofing. Building a shelter requires gathering wood, determining the correct structure and insulating the shelter from rain or wind. While shelters can vary in complexity, many early human shelters were temporary and constructed in response to environmental pressures such as rain or cold temperatures. Constructing a boat, by contrast, involves a greater understanding of materials, engineering, and hydrodynamics. Homo erectus would have needed to select wood that was light enough to float but sturdy enough to hold together under pressure. Carving a hull, ensuring a vessel was both durable and waterproof, and conceptualizing a design that would allow it to float and transport people or goods, would have required more abstract thinking than building a shelter. Boat building also necessitates understanding how water interacts with materials and how to create a structure that would remain stable on water. Both processes require the use of natural materials, but the construction of a boat likely demanded a higher level of planning, cooperation and transmission of knowledge, skills that would be bolstered by language. For ancient humans in Asia, teak driftwood would have been the best choice for dugout canoes, combining durability with the ability to withstand long exposure to water. Mangrove and cedar driftwood could also have been viable options, particularly in coastal and estuarine regions. Found primarily in Southeast Asia, teak is prized for its resistance to water, rot and insects, making it an excellent choice for canoes. It is durable and easy to work with, though somewhat heavier than other woods. If driftwood from teak trees washes ashore, it would be excellent for dugout canoes. Teak is renowned for its natural resistance to water, rot and marine borers. It is durable even after extended water exposure, and it can be carved relatively easily when fresh. The use of driftwood for building canoes was an innovative solution in many ancient cultures, including the indigenous people of Papua New Guinea. Ancient driftwood, abundant in coastal regions and riverbanks, would have been a valuable resource for early humans particularly Homo erectus. In this context, driftwood offered a naturally pre-shaped material that was relatively easy to manipulate, especially with simple tools like the Akulian hand axe. In regions such as Southeast Asia, including Papua New Guinea, 
driftwood was especially abundant due to the high concentration of rivers, the proximity of forests to shorelines, and the effects of monsoon seasons, which would carry large logs out to sea. Once deposited on shores, this driftwood became an essential material for early human groups, offering a ready supply of timber for constructing shelters, boats, and tools. In ancient times, this resource would have been much more plentiful than today, as large forests covered much of the planet, and extreme weather events would have contributed to the transportation of driftwood to coastlines. For example, ancient Hawaiians used redwood trees that had drifted all the way from California to construct their boats. Canoes made from hollowed-out driftwood logs would have been relatively simple to construct and could have served early human populations in coastal regions. Canoes would be much better for open water travel than a raft for many obvious reasons. Driftwood, especially after being exposed to seawater, often becomes soft and more pliable, making it easier to carve than freshly cut wood. This process breaks down the fibres of the wood, reducing its density and making it more malleable for early human tool users. Driftwood could be hollowed out using simple stone tools, making it a prime candidate for early watercraft construction. The Aculean hand axe, one of the most iconic and widespread tools used by early humans, was characterised by its teardrop shape, sharp edges and bifacial design. This versatile tool was used for a variety of tasks, from cutting and chopping to scraping and shaping wood. Carving out driftwood with an Aculean hand axe would have been an accessible task for early humans due to the softness of weathered driftwood. While the idea of hafting Aculean hand axes to wooden handles remains speculative due to the limited direct evidence, it is plausible that late Aculean populations may have experimented with this technique, the hafting of tools represents a significant evolutionary step in human technology, and experimental archaeology shows that it is technically feasible to attach an Aculean hand axe to a handle. Nevertheless, the predominant use of these tools was likely hand-held, as they were well designed for that purpose. The hand axe's sharp edge could easily gouge out the softened wood, allowing early humans to create hollowed sections within the logs. By working in a systematic fashion, they could gradually deepen the hollow, creating a vessel capable of floating on water. The relatively simple nature of this process, combined with the abundance of driftwood, suggests that early humans in regions like Papua, New Guinea and Java could have produced canoes with relative ease, even with the simple tools at their disposal. The ability to construct watercraft such as hollowed-out driftwood canoes would have been a crucial factor in the early migration of human populations, particularly across island regions. In places like Papua New Guinea, where islands are separated by narrow straits of water, early humans would have needed some form of boat to travel between them. The use of driftwood to construct canoes or rafts would have facilitated this migration and allowed early humans to explore new territories, fish more effectively, and transport goods and people across water. However, the simplicity of these driftwood vessels did not detract from their utility. Even a rudimentary canoe made from a hollowed-out log would have provided significant advantages for early human groups, enabling them to exploit marine resources travel along coastlines, and move between islands with greater efficiency. The construction of watercraft from driftwood was likely a key factor in early human migration and the development of coastal and island-based societies. Daniel Everett, a prominent scholar in the field of linguistics and anthropology, has argued that the ability to build sophisticated tools, such as boats, is intricately connected with the development of language, but others say that there is little evidence that Homo erectus was a sophisticated seafarer, let alone had language. I don't accept that Homo erectus must have had boats. Tsunamis could have moved early humans on rafts of vegetation, stated Chris Stringer, head of human origins at the Natural History Museum in London. According to Everett, language is not just a medium for communication, but a cognitive tool that allows humans to organize and transmit complex information, such as the instructions needed to build a shelter or construct a boat. Boats, particularly, require a sophisticated understanding of buoyancy, arboreal knowledge, and the coordination of group activities, such as gathering materials and assembling them in a coherent structure. The construction of such tools likely necessitated a form of communication among Homo erectus. 
In Homo erectus, the brain's growth over time, including in areas associated with problem-solving and social cooperation, suggests that they may have developed a form of communication complex enough to share information about boat building. The FOXP2 gene is often referred to as the language gene because it plays a critical role in the development of speech and language abilities. Mutations in this gene are associated with speech and language disorders in modern humans. FOXP2 is not unique to humans, but the human version of the gene differs in two specific ways from that found in chimpanzees and other non-human primates. These small changes in the FOXP2 gene are thought to be important for the development of human speech and language. Both Homo sapiens and Neanderthals share the same two key mutations in the FOXP2 gene. This indicates that the last common ancestor of modern humans and Neanderthals, who lived around 500,000 to 600,000 years ago, also had these mutations. These genetic changes likely predate the split between the Homo sapiens and Neanderthal lineages, suggesting that the capacity for complex speech and language could have been present in both species. The two key mutations in the FOXP2 gene that occurred in the last common ancestor may have helped enhance the neural circuitry related to speech and fine motor control necessary for articulate speech. These mutations affected brain regions critical for controlling the mouth, face and tongue muscles used in speaking, as well as higher cognitive functions related to understanding and producing language. The discovery that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens share the same FOXP2 mutations has profound implications for understanding the evolution of language. It suggests that the ability to communicate through speech may have been inherited from a common ancestor and was not exclusive to modern humans. However, other factors, including brain size and structure, social complexity and culture, likely also played significant roles in the development of sophisticated language. The hypothesis that Homo erectus could construct boats is supported by evidence of early human migrations to island regions that would have required crossing significant bodies of water. Archaeological evidence from Southeast Asia and Papua provides clues about the movement of early humans, specifically Homo erectus and later hominins, across these regions. In the Philippines, archaeological sites suggest that early hominins, including Homo erectus, may have crossed the sea to reach islands including Luzon. The discovery of a butchered rhinoceros on Luzon, dated to around 709,000 years ago, indicates that hominins were present on the island much earlier than previously thought. Given that Luzon was not connected to the mainland by land bridges at any time, the most plausible explanation is that these early humans crossed the sea, possibly using rafts or simple boats. Flores, an island in Indonesia, presents another intriguing case. The discovery of Homo floresiensis, a small-bodied hominin species on the island, dated to nearly one million years ago, suggests that early humans managed to reach Flores despite it being separated by significant water barriers. This indicates that hominins, whether they were Homo erectus or another species, had developed the technology or strategies needed to cross open water using rudimentary boats. Evidence from Papua New Guinea also suggests early human seafaring. While most archaeological evidence points to Homo sapiens being the first colonizers of this region, genetic studies indicate that modern Papuans have significant genetic overlap with southern Denisovans, another archaic human species. Denisovans interbred with Homo erectus populations in the region or shared similar migration patterns, suggesting that archaic humans in this area had the capacity to traverse difficult terrain and cross water barriers. In fact, a recent genetic study pinpointed the split between northern Denisovans and southern Denisovans that bred with Papuans at 363,000 years ago. This could be when this group arrived in Papua and became isolated from the main Denisovan group. Furthermore, recent morphological analysis suggests that archaic human skulls found in Java and dated to around 100,000 years ago may in fact be the elusive Denisovans rather than late Homo erectus as previously assumed. 
While no direct evidence of Homo erectus boat building has been found, the presence of early humans in island regions separated by water strongly supports the hypothesis that they possessed some form of watercraft technology. The question of whether Homo erectus could build boats is ultimately tied to their cognitive and technological abilities. While Homo erectus had a smaller brain than modern humans, they showed significant advancements in toolmaking, hunting, and social cooperation. Meanwhile, the Aculean hand axes associated with Homo erectus indicate a capacity for planning, foresight, and an understanding of how to manipulate natural materials. The ability to build boats may have been an extension of these technological and social skills, as constructing a seaworthy vessel would have required the same types of problem-solving and cooperation seen in other aspects of their lives. As discussed, language would have been a crucial component in this process. While it is unlikely that Homo erectus had fully developed language in the way modern humans do, they likely had a form of proto-language that allowed them to share the complex information needed to construct boats. This form of communication would have enabled them to work together in groups, select appropriate materials, and design functional vessels for crossing open bodies of water. The evidence suggests that Homo erectus, while not as cognitively advanced as Homo sapiens, possessed the cognitive abilities, social cooperation, and the linguistic skills necessary to build simple boats or rafts. Archaeological findings from the Philippines, Flores, and Papua New Guinea support the idea that early humans, including Homo erectus, migrated across significant water barriers, indicating that they likely had some form of watercraft technology. The ability to construct boats required not only technical skills, but also the capacity to communicate and cooperate with others. In this sense, the development of language and technology were likely intertwined, with each advancing the other in a feedback loop that eventually led to the more complex societies and technologies of modern humans. In summary, while direct evidence of Homo erectus boat building has yet to be discovered, the circumstantial evidence from their migration patterns, tool-making abilities, and the insights provided by linguists suggest that this hypothesis is very plausible. <music>